From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 61, recorded on October 28th, 2020. Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey there, Vincent. Good to be back from LD Home Nursery Studios, I guess you would say. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're coming off that amazing Tuivo 60, right? That was really fun. That was really fun. So we had about a dozen colleagues who recorded, uh, now that we're all Zoom, aficionados, recorded roughly five-minute clips talking about the future of evolutionary biology, of evolutionary genetics. And then thank you for doing some real legwork there to, to kind of thread those all together in the editing process and putting together that really fun episode. Yeah, I actually it was easier than I thought it would be. It went together pretty well and it looked good, I thought, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No, it was great. So having those clips just to be able to put those in yeah. as we, I think that really, yeah, it was really nice. And I've heard some really great feedback, um, including from some of our guests who then, you know, listen to themselves, but also to the mm. other collection. Yeah. And I think yeah, that was good. a really fun kind of confluence of ideas. And so that turned out to be really good. All right. So we're a little on the long side, but, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's okay. not unusual. We are <laughs> entering now the second five years, right? Yeah, Tweevo. sixth season of Tuivo. And <laughs> I feel like we've got, <laughs> we've got some wind in our sails. There's so much incredible work to continue to um, lift up and discuss. And so uh, can't wait to dive into the next chapter here. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. 61. Let's go. A here few go. things before we start. <laughs> um, yeah. If you uh, like what we do, you can support us. Now, the months of October and November, if you contribute to Parasites Without Borders in um, honor of Microbe TV, they will double the contribution. They will match it, right? So you go to parasiteswithoutborders.com and Daniel Griffin, who runs that organization, it's a nonprofit. Um, they will they will uh, match your donation. So for October, November, uh, you should check that out. We'd appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and uh, and Daniel, uh, as I think most listeners know, has been doing incredible work both in the clinic but also on TWIV this week in, in virology. Indeed. Uh, on uh, the SARS-2 experience in New York hospitals. Really, yep. yeah, really important stuff. Yes, Daniel comes on every week and gives a clinical update. And, um, uh, you know, it's uh, not not going away. It's just increasing now, as you know. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's not, yeah, I, I'm not, shouldn't, here. shouldn't laugh, but um, the fall has brought on a, another uptick. We've had, if you look at the, the epi curve, we had one and it went down. We had another. Mm around the summer, went down, and now we have a third one. I wonder how yeah. many we're going to have. Yeah, good question. And, um, you know, some really troubling signs in the Mountain West, the upper Midwest. Yes. I think a lot of us are following it, and so that's been right on our radar. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, in Utah, the just recently, the positivity or the p positive test rate mm. is north of 15%. Oh, that's very high. Be, that's very high. Exactly. You want to be three to 5%. And I think a lot of um, folks, you know, you, you, could, you might still say, oh, well, it's still fewer than one in a thousand people, but no, it's not because there's all of this under, uh, you know, under the cover yeah. um, spread of the infection happening. And that's a symptom of it, those high yeah. positivity rates. No, we don't so. test everyone. That's the problem. We only test a certain yeah. number of people. So there are a lot more infected that we don't know about. Yeah, like North Dakota, Wisconsin, uh, Montana, they're all getting hammered, right? Yeah, I think we're in, uh, I think uh, Joe Biden actually said it in maybe the last presidential debate, we're in for a dark winter. I think that that's uh, what's shaping up here. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Also, I wanna uh, let listeners know, if you're on Instagram, we started a new Microbe TV account. This is done by a listener, actually Lauren from Philadelphia. She decided she wanted to do this. And so go over to Instagram, microbe.tv is the username, subscribe. And what she does is she summarizes all the podcasts in a couple of paragraphs, puts a cool graphic in, uh, tries to engage people like by asking questions. What do you think about this? What's your opinion? Really nice job so far, Lauren. So um, wow. it's all the Microbe TV podcasts. 
And I appreciate Lauren doing it because I couldn't do it. I don't have, to, I don't have no <laughs> You and <bandwidth>. me both. <laughs> no, and this is news to me. So I need to, as soon as I get up, we finish up and wrap up our recording, I'm going to head over to Instagram. And thanks in advance, Lauren. This is really, really kind of you. Yes, very I kind. I really appreciate that way of amplifying right, what's our, on What's on the menu work. today, Nels? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, let's dive right in. So, you know, um, because our fifth year anniversary podcast, the 60th episode, took a little while, we had a full roster of mail in the old mailbag to consider, but we couldn't get to it. Uh, and so I think we're going to spend some significant time mm -hmm. today doing that. But before we do that, I thought it might be good to do a uh, what I'll call a quick shot and a chaser on, <laughs> SAR <laughs> on SARS-2 evolution. Um, of course, we're only doing this once a month. We're not doing it twice a week like TWIV. So we're uh, you know, being overrun by um, evolutionary stories. But, uh, you know, I heard, actually, stay tuned, there's a great evolutionary story on the coming up on the latest TWIV. It sounded like you were um, discussing a paper from Svante Pebo. Yeah, on uh, the uh, descendants, the inheritance of uh, severe COVID risk loci from Neanderthals, right up his alley. And it's a nature paper with two authors on it. Him and someone else. Isn't that cool? I mean, I don't know any COVID-19 paper that has two authors. It's <laughs> <That's> amazing. <right. laughs> That's a little yeah, kind of cool. traditional evolutionary style. Yep. Worth checking out. I remember seeing that come across my radar. Um, uh, that was a month or two back, wasn't it, when it was first mm -hmm. maybe released? But yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting one. Uh, we're not going to do that one here. But um, so the shot is going to be, you know, not, not only is there good work coming out, interesting work, compelling work, but there's also... Um, you know, as we've discussed in, uh, in some cases in real detail, some, you know, maybe less than sterling work. So that will be our shot. It's a, actually a kind of a perspective piece that just launched in PNAS and we're, we won't spend too much time on it. And then the chaser to try to cleanse the palate a little bit <laughs> will be an inter interesting <laughs> case study That's good. Um, in a immunocompromised patient um, and where um, with a persistent SARS-2 infection. And then some sort of on the spot um, genomic, um, you know, analysis of the SARS two and, and tracking the mutations actually. So that we'll we'll kind of step through those two really quickly, and then we'll um, jump into the mailbag. Okay, so the first one is the the, sh the shot here is titled "The Pandemic Exposes Human Nature: Ten Evolutionary Insights." This was published um, maybe a week or two in. Uh, Proceedings National Academy of Science um, kind of came on my radar just across the Twitter feeds on social media. Um, this kind of got some, I would say, some um, uh, critical attention um, uh, going through some of these insights. And um, as it relates to, you, would all, you could almost say evolutionary psychology or sort of the, some of the ideas about sort of behavioral um changes coming um, from sort of pandemic um, exposure. So um, we'll actually, as I sort of promised, I don't think we're going to go, we won't do a deep dive. And in fact, I kind of don't want to give this too much oxygen, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that, but, not to not give yeah. it too much oxygen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've, you have you all have dealt with that on TWIV quite a bit yeah. um, as well. It is, a, the, is an the, odd paper. Uh, do you know any of these authors, Nels? Yeah. I do um, a few of them, and and to say um, this isn't you know we have seen cases where people have really jumped far afield to try to get on record kind of quickly on SARS two, and that's not the, that's not the case here. These are people who, you know, um, that in some cases I think have published very controversial things in the past, so mm -hmm. it's not so totally out of character, but it's also um, you know so, sort of toward um, you know the these this field or thinking about. Yeah. Um, sort of evolutionary implications for things like behavior or psychology, sort of human behavior um, in particular. Really complicated. I mean, I think as we've seen in a lot of our episodes, you know, we end up talking, one of the reasons we spend a lot of time talking about the evolution of microbes, of viruses, is because this kind of really simplifies the genetics become much more simple. Um, even when we move into things like insects, you know, relatively simple model systems, all of a sudden the complexity is up. You go another level up to vertebrates, um, and then another level to human kind of, um, you know, implications where now we're, uh, you know, cultural and all of the other kind of yeah. complexity there. Yeah. It, it's just really hard to kind of uh, frame and test clean hypotheses. 
Yeah. Um, and that's not to say, you know, that these, it's not that, that, that this shouldn't be done or that people shouldn't try to tackle and think about some of these things. It's just the, you know, taking it with a pretty massive grain of salt given the challenges here. And so that's, I think, in evidence um, with this uh, perspective piece. And so um, actually what I'll do instead of kind of a blow by blow is point our listeners to, if you haven't already seen it, Carl Bergstrom. Uh, who's a colleague up at the University of Washington. Um, great um, quantitative uh, evolutionary biologist and has done some really interesting stuff. He's actually been on the record quite a bit with the pandemic, the SARS-2 pandemic. He's also an, um, a really accomplished author. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying to remember the exact title of the book. It's something like um, calling BS, like basically um, all of the, uh, as statistical arguments are launched in, either sort of pseudoscientific or political settings, um, how to cut through the BS uh, 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 in that space and how to kind of think about statistics from sort of a public um, curiosity level as well. Um, yeah. Also, Call, um, he's Calling BS the art of skepticism <laughs> in a data-driven world. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. R really good. Have, um, have you read it? Um, I've, I haven't read it in depth, um, but I have um, it just pulled out some of the example cases. Um, we've used that um, in, in one of the classes I uh, have taught over the years. Cool. Um, yeah. I, and big recommend on that one. Um, and then he has also written, you know, uh, or co-authored um, textbooks on evolution. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, a, a really good expert here who's actually been a really good voice of reason, I think, um, uh, as some of the SARS-2 issues have arisen, some of these you know, half-baked arguments to go after herd immunity that we see from some corners. And yeah. um, and Carl's been a, a really good voice uh, on social media, on Twitter in particular. And so he he weighed in here on this perspective piece. And so we, we'll put up a link to his sort of Twitter thread. Um, and he really, I think, covers it. But so we'll spend a minute with it. So like the, the, the way the piece is set up is with insights and then kind of scientific agendas mm -hmm. um, as it relates, I think, these 10 points around SARS-2 and then kind of in human behavioral space. So the first one is the virus might alter host sociability. So this is this idea, um, really fascinating idea, that viruses can change host behavior. Um, and, you know, I think some of the best examples of this are in more simple systems. Um, uh, or uh, where, where there's less complexity. So some of the insect viruses, um, uh, viruses that will infect caterpillars and cause these or proposed extended phenotypes where now the caterpillar will um, be more likely to climb the branches of a tree um, if it's infected as the virus is replicating like crazy um, and then sort of dissolves the caterpillar. And if it's up at that higher level, yeah. now those yeah. virus particles disperse down. And so there have been some really fascinating papers proposing that those viruses have somehow acquired a host gene that encodes a hormone uh, that might, uh, that peptide might sort of agitate or stimulate the caterpillar to behave differently uh, when it's infected with the virus. So it's not like this, I mean, this is a fascinating area, but then, you know, it's kind of one of these cases. And I think you've, we, we, <laughs> you've grappled with this. We've all grappled with this in the kind of scientific literature um, in the last eight months or so is to then just take an idea and sort of intermingle it immediately with SARS-2 as if there's something there. And so, um, you know, so here, one of the ideas is that they kind of throw out there, I think without really any evidence at all, is that somehow SARS-2 could be changing um, uh, not only host physiology, sort of the almost necessary um, side effects of any virus infection that's sort of uh, perking a massive immune response um, and having uh, negative impacts in sort of a pathogenic setting, but then that it could also be um, enhancing its evolutionary success by actually changing host behavior. So somehow making you feel invincible or like you're not sick somehow, like that the virus somehow encodes that ability. So, you know, <laughs> Carl points out immediately, well, this is a virus that uh, we think came from a bat less than a year yes. ago or so, you yes. know, somewhere in that time <laughs> range. And so how, <laughs> how is it then that you would have this sort of complicated phenotype or this extended phenotype um, already sort of Baked um, in. gaining yeah. a purchase? Yeah. And so, yeah. And, um, you know, the virus anyway, from the start transmitted really well. It didn't need to alter human behavior to do that. I mean, that's the problem here. We're not, they're not considering that you don't really need 
a very transmissible virus doesn't have to alter host behavior. There are plenty of hosts around, you know? Yeah. So it's, yep, that's right. And yep. uh, as you say, there's no, there are no data. It's just their idea. They had this idea. So they applied it to SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> yeah. And then you can kind of step through like nine more <laughs> examples of that. Uh, we won't do that just on in the interest of time. One of them is um, that so they think having p- kids stay at home, they're not going to get the right microbiome. Which yeah, that seems like a I stretch. think kids are going to get it microbiome. They're going to go out in the backyard, or they're going to roll around on the rug where there's plenty of mic. I just don't think they <laughs> thought this through. <laughs> no, I mean I don't know what your rug looks like over there at your home studio, Vincent. Mine, mine are all a complete mess. So yeah, I agree. I'm I not mean, we have about, dogs, right? And that's a perfect yeah, way course, to get that's... a microbiome to a kid. Kids <laughs> kiss the dogs. I mean, I, I don't think it's making a yeah. whit of difference, frankly. And if you yeah. wrote a grant application to study the microbiome of quarantine kids, I don't think you'd ever get it funded. Yeah, I think that's uh, correct. So this also, you know, stepping back a little bit. So there is, um, and some of the authors here are in this emerging field of um, what's known as evolutionary medicine. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there are there is something to this, but it's a little, again, sort of I would put up a kind of proceed with caution maybe idea here. Um a little bit the same way we've talked about how, um, you know, sort of in evolutionary genetics, a lot of the um, emerging um, labs, a lot of the emerging scientists sort of grew up maybe not like taking formal evolution classes, mm-hmm. myself included, um, but instead sort of in a more kind of traditional genetics background yeah. where we're doing things like setting up genetic screens, et cetera. And in doing that, um, everything starts to look like an adaptation because that's what we've kind of trained on. That's what we've selected for. Yeah, good and point. so it almost good like, point. yeah, it almost sort of like s- kind of sl- just slips into your mindset. Yeah. And we've had some really fun conversations with folks like Matt Hahn, others on sort of avoiding that adaptionist trap. Um, I would put out maybe a similar caution flag here with evolutionary medicine. So, you know, as medical doctors, and actually we'll talk about this in the chaser uh, in a minute mm-hmm. or two, which is a medical case. Um, I think it, folks trained as physicians and in medical practice, it really like it's it's patient focused, right? It's the individual. And so when you first sort of mix that with evolutionary ideas, the danger is, you know, you know evolution works in populations, right? And so, yes. you know, what happens to any one individual might be the least sort of um, consequential impact of some, you know, change a population changing its environment or being exposed to a new pathogenic microbe, um, something along those lines. And so I think, you know, it's really important to keep that balanced view about how mutations move through populations, how populations rise and fall, how species diversify, and to be really cautious about not kind of putting that individual at the center of some of the ideas. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's kind of what's, what might be happening here in some of the, some of these, some of uh, the, Insights have nothing to do with evolution, actually, as far True. as I can tell. Yeah. I mean, you know, this idea that um, gender inequality is increasing, this has been a concern of uh, others because, you know, with kids having to stay home, women typically bear the burden. And so that's a real issue, but it has nothing yeah. to do with the evolution of the virus or host or anything like that. (laughs) No, no, that's right. And so it's also kind of a grab bag here of, you know, sort of other knock on um, effects to human societies even. And so the author list is pretty broad. In fact, in the, I think in the acknowledgement section, you know, or the contribution section, it it sort of says which authors contributed which one. And then there's a little disclaimer at the bottom that says not all authors agree with all of the sort of 10 points. And so even I think among the author list, I think it's even a controversial and contentious piece. I think it's kind of the thing where it caught um, people a little um, sideways uh, when this came out was that it just, you know, there's some, there's actually, as we've seen, as people kind of launch um, potentially half-baked ideas Mm. um, during a pandemic where there's not just sort of scientific interests, but there's political interests that some of the um, ideas can get picked up. And even if it's not meant that way, they can sort of um, you know, mutate or be applied in a way exactly. that could really move science backwards. I think, and Carl mentions that actually in his great thread as he kind of steps through. Yeah, that's a good point. The, I mean, that's the, 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 the yeah, it's that's the case with the Barrington Declaration, right? Yeah, it wasn't a course, paper; yeah. it was just some ideas, but um, people then used it to their benefit. And you could do the same thing with this. Now, people are allowed to publish their uh, 
hypotheses and their musings. Um, I think here, uh, this is the proceedings of the National Academy, and th you can get things published. You can approach an Academy member and say, hey, would you uh, submit this for us? And it's kind of an easy way in, right? So it doesn't have to be reviewed, but, you know, as they say here at the end, um, they say, uh, there are no data underlying this work. And so <laughs> there's a low bar for review, right? Yeah. It's just ideas. <laughs> what can you say? Your idea is wrong? Well, you're allowed to propose a wrong idea. But remember, there, and that's amazing, there are no data underlying their, their discussion here, which is kind of not what I like to do. I like to have data-driven discussion. Yeah, right? no, th th that's right. And especially, you know, a title like Proceeding of National Academy of Sciences. Um, I mean, that's a long running journal for better and for worse, actually, because yeah. of exactly the, the, some of the um, pathways to publication that you're mentioning. I mean, there's been a lot of snags in a lot of sort of, um, yeah, um, controversial stuff that's come up to be even, you know, kind of polite about it. Um, sort of a black eye on the journal. And this feels like another example. Well, what they're that. saying, basically, after each agenda, after each insight, they have a little par a few sentences of what should we do? And they su they suggest research that should be collect that should be done to collect data to address these. Okay. And you know, that's, that's not going to go anywhere. People do what they want to do. Not they're not going to be motivated by this, right? So in that sense, it's not harmful. But you know, someone could take these things and say, "Look, we're ruining our society. We're we're messing with the microbiome. We're messing with gender." There's another one about um, altering um, sex drive, and the kids are going to the birth rate's going to go down. And so you can imagine someone saying, "Look." We have to open up because we're wrecking our society, and that's not good, yeah. right? That's right. No, exactly right. And it kind of goes back to some of the – it starts to get swirled into some of the political stuff. Yeah, and in terms of the agenda, I mean, in some cases, I think the ideas are sort of so embryonic that if if a lab did sort of kind of try to pursue some of these ideas yeah. – so, for example, you know, this idea that this could be causing – uh, mood disorders in a way that promote the spread replication of the virus or that it fits into that sort of behavioral modification yeah. um, in yeah. human population. I think it would be a dead end, um, to be honest, given that what we already know about the biology of the virus. And so I wanted to ask you, yeah, Nels, what do you think about this <laughs> statement? We have not evolved to seek the truth. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> a think? pretty provocative uh, you know, one. This gets, and this gets into evolutionary psychology, yeah. um, which is, you know, sort of famously a slippery turf to, <laughs> to try to navigate. Um, and that's, you know, that's also, so, you know, if you did kind of try to join in on the agenda and frame a hypothesis, how do you do that in a way that you can really falsify that in a rigorous way? Yeah. Really challenging. And not to say that it's not worth thinking about or trying to tackle, but my goodness, it's sort of like, you know, looking at Mount Everest as a day climber and saying, I'm going to make it to the peak in, um, you know, two days or something. It has that sort of mismatch in yeah. sort of the task versus um, our skills just as a, as scientists. Right. And so, yeah, no, in that case, I mean, I don't know. So it gets into all kinds of, for me, I just like, I get kind of scared away by even trying to like delve too into that. So, um, you know, because now we're starting to mix in a lot of cultural things. So like, you know, uh, and so I think it, I, where I would start is sort of like what are um, some really interesting work on what, what are the origins of religions, right? Or the origin of gods or multiple different gods over human history. And I think, you know, some really actually interesting ideas about how like transitions from hunter gatherer societies into more agricultural societies. Mm. And then um, kind of correlating that with what that meant in terms of some of the traditions and then the emergence, the kind of convergent emergence independent emergence of different gods in different societies and how they were sort of treated um, or, or how central the role was. And so, you know, as soon as you start peeling back in, in a way, the layers of the onion of any of these things, then how does that sort of fit into human nature? It becomes so complicated and, yeah, and so tricky. For sure. And so for me, yeah, it's a little bit of one of those like 10 foot pole scenarios. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, so that's our shot. <laughs> why don't we, why don't we, it, it really is a little bit funny that that got in and, and um, I think a pretty strong um, response from some of our colleagues um, out there that was, um, and, and it's good actually, I think to weigh in from time to time and make sure that people are sort yeah. of um, kind of perking up to some of these things. So that's a shot, the chaser.
um, a little pa uh, palate cleanser here, is a paper that just emerged, I think maybe about a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a case study. So it's, it's, uh, the title is Prolonged uh, SARS-CoV-2 Replication in an Immunocompromised Patient. Very short case study. And this isn't like some meant to be portrayed as like a massive um, breakthrough, but it's a, um, I think what it does is it kind of illustrates um, a, actually maybe a, a good example in the field of evolutionary medicine um, where you can start to put together, you know, in this case, a single patient's um, story or medical experience um, a little bit with the um, diversification of the virus population yeah. um, that's in, in this case, the SARS-2 virus population that's um, causing the uh, infection. So the case study, this is from a uh, Adam Loring's in a lab at the University of Michigan and some of his collaborators. Adam is really a spectacular person and scientist. He's an MD, PhD. So he actually does cross over between clinical work and infectious disease. Um, and then also uh, evolutionary virology, a focus on influenza. But of course he, like all of us have been, um, you know, our, our attention has been moved to the, the pandemic. Um, so in the paper is led by one of Adam's colleagues, um, Jihoon Bang. And he's an infectious disease doc there at the University of Michigan. And so um, they report, uh, it's a patient who has uh, lymphoma and some, I think some other um, kind of serious health uh, conditions that also have caused this person to become immunocompromised. And so they track um, at what is at least a 120 day course of infection. And so that's long, isn't it? Like what's the, roughly the average of SARS-2 infections? That's 20 days. Productive? Okay. Yeah. So, you I know, I mean, that's already... actually the longest that people have been found to shed infectious virus, you know, but mm -hmm. typically yeah. uh, 10, 13, 14 days is it, is that it's it, you're done. You know, for mild yeah. cases. So, yeah, exactly. And so, and, the, and immunocompetent patients, yeah. right? Yeah. Is that the, yeah. And so, um, I think what this the study illustrates is, um, you know, that that's not, that certainly there is a, a large, not overwhelming, but a, a, a significant population of immunocompromised folks who, who are vulnerable to infection, and of course, SARS-2 included. And so, now this could extend the window. Yeah of virus shedding past 20 days. In this case, you know, actually I think the patient came back after a hundred days. Um, they thought that it might've sort of tamped down the virus infection, but in fact, you know, either he was reinfected or um, it sort of uh, flared back up. So because they had done, um, you know, good sampling in Adam's virology lab and even sort of cultured the virus. They um, amplified mm -hmm. the samples in Vero cells. Um, there could be a little drawback there, right, of the population that's being replicated in Vero cells might have different yeah. um, sort of, uh, you know, diversification. They tried to minimize that um, uh, than the natural samples. But then um, that what they could do is, or what they did, is then they could collect enough virus to then do um, full genome sequencing mm -hmm. on some of these samples throughout that 120 day course. And so, you know, immediately some practical things that could fall from that data set were things like, okay, it's actually not a second infection. It's right. the same one. Right. So there's the shared uh, mutations or the shared variation um, in that strain from all the sampling points and then increases in variation um, as they stepped through uh, the, the time course. And so, um, you know, and then what you can do given all of the other genome sampling that's going on in um, other um, uh, infection patients with infections, you can start to compare that. And so they make a few um, points about the mutations that they tracked over the course of this uh, case study. And so, for example, none of the mutations that they saw um, that were um, that were coming up from the uh, sort of the first sampling, the first exposure or first encounter with the patient, um, none of those new mutations were over, above a quarter of a percent frequency if you compared that against all of the other hmm. genomes that have been deposited publicly. And this is in the um, GISAID uh, database. And I think it's now roughly 170,000 hmm. um, genomes. I don't know how many of those are high quality, actually, mm -hmm. um, and, and full genomes. But wow. <laughs> it's an unprecedented level of sampling from um, patients across the world. Um, that have been put in there. So anyway, so I think what you can maybe a hint of a conclusion there is that, you know, very, the, the, the very few 
um, sort of shared mutations that have risen to high levels in other patients. So it's almost like a private history of diversification in a sense, um, or a rare history of diversification. Yeah, um, you know, now as I get the yeah, impression, this is a four month period, mm -hmm. and I get the impression there are quite a few mutations because I think this, this if you take any two isolates, I think they only differ by a few mutations. You know, if you pick any of those two isolates in the database and the virus is changing at a, and we've talked about this a long time ago, it's changing at, you know, 20 or so changes per year. Yep. So these, you know, seem to be a lot, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't know, it's less than yeah. 10, but it still seems yep. for a four month period, a lot of changes. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And so I think what it might illustrate is the sort of the difference in how most of sa most samples are ascertained versus how these ones were within a single patient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for most of those independent observations, what has necessarily had to happen is the virus that has had to go from one host to one individual to another. Yeah. And there's a lot of biology that unfolds in that transmission, true, right? True. And I think that probably puts some constraints yeah. on yep. the particles that sort of successfully navigate across one host to the next. Whereas here, what we're seeing over that four month period is, you know, it's it's all in house, <laughs> so yeah, to speak. It's all sure. in this one patient. And so I think that probably like relaxes a little bit and allows more mutations. And again, we should be careful. So, you know, um, mutations are generally pretty quiet things. Yes. They might yes. be neutral. They might be slightly deleterious. Yeah. Um, very rare that you get these sort of, you know, massive impact mutations that are really consequential. So I think that would be consistent with the, what they observed there versus the patterns that you're describing, which I agree mm. is this does look like a lot of mutations given that time course. But I think it's because there's sort of a different, um, you know, and, and this would be happening obviously in all patients, but it's what can go across to another yeah. host or another right. individual, right. a new patient that would sort of dictate that's some of point. that. That's a good point. It makes um, sense. Yeah. 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 The other thing that's very interesting is that uh, throughout this poor guy's course, uh, clinical course, at each, he had multiple uh, PCR tests. Every time he went back in the hospital, he'd have another one. And yeah. they actually report them all in the CT values. And they did PCR with two primer pairs, two sets of primer pairs, right? And two different genes, Spike and ORF1AB, which is perfect. It's the way to do it properly. You get really, you make sure it's not a false positive. And they report the CT values at each test for both primer pairs. And I just want to point out, oh, all of these are less than 30 with one exception. One is 30.7. But we think in general that if you are CT value 34 and above, you are not shedding infectious virus. So this man at most of these time points was probably shedding infectious virus, which is of course um, shown by the culturing in, in cells, as you mentioned. So that's the other issue here. This is an unusual situation where you have an immunosuppressed patient, virus is reproducing for a long period, and that poses a risk to everyone around him because it's unusual. Most people are over after a certain period of time. And every time this guy came back in the hospital, he's putting other people at risk. So it's a, it's a very difficult situation. Yeah. No, really good point, uh, Vincent. And I think, you know, that kind of illustrates maybe another sort of P potential um, uh, consequence for sort of um, adaptation revolution. So, are you know, depending on the size of an immunocompromised pool, mm -hmm. and the fact that you sort of both extend that shedding window and allow the virus potentially to sample more mutations under somewhat relaxed constraints, yeah. is there just more diversity in the virus population? And what does that mean, sort of, for hitting on one of those potentially rare jackpot mutations? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, so no, it's a really interesting. Um, kind of bigger questions, whether it's the current pandemic, other viruses, future pandemics, um, to start to understand how some of these dynamics, how, you know, yeah, both time and space, depending on hosts and the quality of the host that the viruses are replicating, in, yeah. Um, yeah. what that means um, for for all kinds of things, um, including the evolution of the virus. Now, now every um, time he was readmitted, they recognized that uh, he was infected and they they're giving him immunosuppressive drugs for his cancer that prevent the, the synthesis of antibodies. And so yeah. they had to give him an antiviral remdesivir and they also gave him, and they gave it to him twice, and they also gave twice convalescent plasma uh, 
because he couldn't make his own antibodies that in an attempt to stem the infection. And both times it did, but it never got rid of it completely. And so it always came back. Yeah, exactly right. And then that raised actually, and then those two treatments or interventions then raises the question, does that put pressure? So it's, you know, you've relaxed the pressure yeah. by sort of turning down the volume on the immune response or also as the sort of his progressive illness is, is involved in that. But then by sort of intervening, does then that increase the pressure and then have a consequence? And so they looked kind of, you know, so there's, you know, people have done experiments where, um, they're, they're replicating, yeah. you know, in culture, um, in the presence of remdesivir and then collecting viruses over pa after passage, after passage. And there are mutations or resistance mutations that will arise, I mean, in particular in the, um, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And so they look across and actually they found a mutation in the RDRP short for <laughs> the polymerase. And, um, but you know, it doesn't match the ones from drug resistance. Yeah. So they don't think yeah. that there's, that that was a, yep. Um, similar as you're pointing out with the, um, convalescent plasma and bringing in the antibodies, they didn't detect any, um, you know, um, sort of noticeable mutations and spike that could be that sort of cat and mouse game of the antibodies recognizing something on the virus surface, um, spike protein in particular, with, and then could, where you have yeah. sort of the evolutionary chase. And so that wasn't seen as well. Now there's a, this is a very an interesting case where an acute virus, normally one that's come and gone in a week or two, becomes chronic. And there's another example with polio virus. And uh, many people who um, don't have the ability to make antibodies, they they have a defect. It's called a gamma globulinemia. They're given the polio vaccine at a year of age, and um, it's not actually known that they have this condition at that age. And then the polio vaccine can reproduce in them for decades. Wow. Yeah. And it evolves. And people have have sequenced the shed virus because it's a fecally shed vaccine virus. They've studied the evolution. And, it, you know, there are a number of changes every year that accumulate. And eventually it becomes very much like wild type polio virus. It's neurovirulent. It's able to cause paralysis. Of course, the people shedding it have um, are protected because they're given um, um, antibody, well, convalescent sera, basically, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, every mm -hmm. two weeks of their life once they're determined mm -hmm. wow. to be agamma wow. globulinemic. So they're protected against paralysis, but they're a threat to others, right? Fortunately, we do have a polio vaccine, which you're using, but you know, the plan one day is to stop using it. And then these individuals, and we don't even know for the most part where they are or who who they are, will be a threat to the eradication. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. No, and also I think it raises some interesting points too, like um, that where I don't think there's a lot of work done out there, but um, in during some of the kind of the post hoc consequential events. Mm -hmm. So are immunocompromised populations involved in spillover events? Um, yeah. We, you know, we know almost nothing about this yeah. um, because usually by the time it's happened, the, sort of that action is over. Yeah, it's already right. into the next population as we're grappling with now. But, um, you know, so could SARS-2, as it moved, you know, if it's let's, just assuming it's a bat or another wildlife source reservoir, into a human population, did it also, did it somehow traverse into the immunocompetent human population through immunocompromised hosts? That's a good point. I think there's a, yeah, I think there's yeah. a, some really interesting questions along those lines. Yeah, that, um, that could allow yeah. it to get a foothold, right? And acquire whatever mutations are needed for better reproduction in humans. And maybe that's why it's rare, you know, because you have to encounter yeah. a immunocompromised person. Yeah, and if it were, if it was sort of a stepping stone through an immunocompromised population, um, as we're seeing in this case study, that could extend the window um, yeah. of sort of an interaction so that you're sort of increasing the sampling time while the virus population is also acquiring or sampling more and more random mutations yeah. potentially. Yeah. So anyway, so I think some interesting, and so, you know, the authors here do, you know, I think do a very balanced treatment. They point out this is one case, um, but, and, and balance their conclusions pretty well. And that's another, I want to hold that up as another, like as a chaser, a, a, a cleanser for the palate is to not turn up the volume too high to sort of, you know, the, the, the ideas, the work probably worth pursuing. I think sometimes, you know, in our kind of 
I don't know, you know, current environment, there's this temptation to sort of really push or try to reach to get recognized, uh, kind of turn up the volume on our yeah. conclusions. And that can also lead, I think, in the first piece, the shot, we see some of that yeah. where there's these really provocative, controversial ideas, but there's just no support behind no, them. This, so, this was very muted. Yeah. It was very well done and caveats noted and not tooting horns. It was great. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, I would big recommend for folks interested in some of these approaches, almost this kind of real time um, within household or within individual um, virus evolution. Adam Loring is really doing some great work on this um, and go to his, we'll put up, we'll post his website, really good um, and interesting work. This is just one small example um, in a lot of the cool stuff they're doing there. All right. Well, we have a pretty full mailbag, so why don't we you bet. transition uh, to that? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and read the first one here. Um, this is a letter from Joe. He writes, Dear Twivo, I'm a physiologist with an evolutionary bent who has been listening to your TWIV episodes since um, keyed in by a past student of mine who is a molecular biologist, and now your TWIVO episodes. I have a deep interest in evolutionary mechanisms and have been trying to see how far the phenomena we have described in higher organisms, some of which communicate with one another, apply to lower levels of communication. So when higher organisms like birds, whales, and primates communicate with one another, they broaden their interface with the environment, which is the driving force in evolution. Um, we called that phenomenon behavioral drive. Uh, citing a paper from 1983. In my education in cell biology from 1960 and uh, on, we learned that some bacteriophage cooperate through their limited gene products to prevent co-infection with other bacteriophage, some classic work in molecular biology. Uh, I'm interested in whether vertebrate viruses also communicate during their infections, uh, which could be described as behavioral drive involving cooperation during an infection to their mutual benefit. I'm particularly interested in why, for instance, uh, clusters of bacteria or a particular load of virus particles uh, is necessary for a successful infection. Is it possible that they're cooperating in the infection and that cultural communication is needed for a successful microbial infection and that there are aspects of cultural inheritance in viruses? And so that paper um, from Wiles et al., I think senior author is um, Alan Wilson, Bird's Behavior and Anatomical Evolution <laughs> in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Some great echoes, actually, from our <laughs> earlier conversation here. Um, and uh, I find, I'm glad I found your podcast and encourage your efforts. Uh, Joe Kunkel, 1960 Columbia College mm -hmm. in your neighborhood, uh, Professor Emeritus at UMass Amherst. So, Thank you so much, Professor Kunkel, for reaching out and for your encouraging words. This is great. Um, uh, some great points lifted up here. So maybe I'll let you take the first swipe at this, Vincent. What do you think about some of these notions of communication between microbial populations, virus populations in particular? Well, uh, yes, for sure. And for there are some good examples. Um, there are many viruses where the one kind of virus is defective and it needs a helper virus to co-infect the same cell in order to reproduce. There are many examples of that, both in uh, viruses of bacteria and and plants and uh, and mammals. And so, for example, um, uh, th there is a great example in a human virus, which is hepatitis delta virus, which only encodes one protein that's not enough to get it packaged. So it has to co-infect a cell infected with hepatitis B virus, which will then provide a, an envelope to package hepatitis delta virus. And so that's one example. There are many others, and there are examples where in infections, uh, defective particles evolve, which lack genetic information. They have to be complemented by other viruses uh, in the population. So I think there are many examples of this kind of cooperation. And, and you may ask, you know, how, how does this emerge, this sort of thing? And must be, it works, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be around. But, um, and, and, and yes, yeah, so I think that this is quite clear and it's probably understudied. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are more examples. And I mean, the, the example I give is just about a defective virus, but you can imagine that two non-defective viruses could somehow exchange gene products and, 
and assist one another. And, and I'm, I'm sure there are probably examples of that that I'm not thinking of, but it's a little harder to study because both viruses quite do, do quite well on their own. Yeah. No, so I totally agree. And also thinking about some of the newly discovered or recently discovered like multipartite viruses that have these sort of yes. um, almost like transient collections of parts of the genome, depending on the cell that you sample or the tissue that you sample, some really like complexity arising and not necessarily for the, <laughs> for the, like that it's some massive advantage in some cases, it could just be the complexity just kind of happened to evolve again, sort of, you know, having an open mind, both sort of adaptionist scenarios where this is driven by sort of a, a selective force, but also complexity just arising in, yeah. in, in, yeah. in systems as well. So maybe to just um, add on a little bit in the bacterial space, since that was brought up. So, you know, obviously some incredible, uh, an entire field sort of in um, bacterial communication, thinking about um, quorum sensing yeah. and um, biofilm formation, things like this. And in some cases, even, you know, a, a really uh, increasingly sophisticated understanding of the molecules involved by the receptors and sort of the secreted factors. Um, I would point out Bonnie Bassler's lab at Princeton, who's doing just incredibly creative and exciting work in that area. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> to be honest, Vincent, I've had this kind of crazy idea when I sit through um, seminars, like by, back before the pandemic, when we all hung out together mm -hmm. in seminar halls and <laughs> listen to each other's science. Like when you just hear people coughing, like I kind of wonder to myself, is that the viruses talking to each other? Like they're, you know, they're causing <laughs> <laughs> you to right. getting to this sort of slippery slope of behavioral modifications here. Are they causing us, the hosts, to cough? And then somehow in those vibrations, the viruses are, can realize, um, you know, sort of interpret this as like a quorum sensing thing based on how, like it's like I could just think of, Oh yeah, there's a um, you know a cold virus telling the other cold virus, "Hey, I'm here. Are you here?" As we're having our other yeah. line of communication going on. So anyway, I think obviously you were, kind of totally you were fanciful. Tainted by the first paper, now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Don't take that last point seriously. But I think the first <laughs> the first points <laughs> on quorum sensing, and then the um, uh, some of the examples that you were giving definitely fit into that into that space. So so absolutely um, some definite uh, you know I think if you open up your definition of what it means to communicate some very clear, um, solid examples of that. And, and again, you know, areas where you can define a clean hypothesis and test it, falsify it. Um, uh, and, and some major advantages of thinking about microbes versus maybe thinking about our own sort of, uh, evolutionary yeah. psychology or you know, all, things along those lines. All right. The next one is from Brian, dear Vincent Nels, another take on the claim that SARS-CoV-2 is lab made or why it's not. It's like saying a lab built a weaver bird nest or termite mound. Humans can pretend to Im imitate neural networks, but not evolution. Consider GMOs, genetically modified organisms. A gene, a promoter, and a terminator get inserted. No chromatin shaping, alternative splicing, RNA feedback, protein networks, the myriad things that evolution causes. It may work because the gene is well known, but it's like inserting a twig in a spider web. To anyone who knows spider webs, it stands out like a sore thumb. To anyone who knows viral genomes, a human inserted gene will be as peculiar. It also won't do something predictable because there aren't viral genes like the Bacillus thuringiensis genes used in crops. Darwin may have been inspired by dog breeding, but no one who studies canines mistakes a wolf or coyote for a dog. SARS-CoV-2 is like a new fox species, while conspiracy theorists claim it's a laboratory retriever. <laughs> nice dogs, but don't blame labs for spreading this virus. <coughs> Excuse me, that's from Brian. He's at True Lights LLC. <laughs> this is great. I like those. As a fan of um, analogies for all of their... Uh, sort of incisive kind of points, and then all of their yeah. <laughs> complicating factors. I mean, I this really, all this is great. <laughs> this all makes perfect sense. The problem is that <clears throat> scientists get this. It's kind of like inside baseball. But people who are not familiar with scientific methods will say, "Well, why not? Why couldn't this happen?" And you know, they don't have the the grounding that allows them to exclude it. And so it's up to us to explain it in some way that they can understand. And it's very difficult when it comes to looking at genomes because they can always say, well, so what that this uh, 
it happened like this. Why couldn't it have happened another way? Why, why not? Why not? You know, that's always the thing. Yeah. Yep. No, no. And then with some kind of nefarious, um, you know, forces in some cases coming in and trying to like add gasoline to the fire with really, I mean, to put twigs in people, <laughs> there's a lot of twigs getting put into the spider web, let's just say. And, um, and to our eye that like, just as, um, Brian is pointing out, it's pretty clear, but then it's, um, yeah. it kind of like, actually, if you put t- too many twigs in a spider, web, I'm going to try to really extend the analogy here. All of a sudden you think spider webs are made out of twigs somehow. And it really yeah. kind of almost clouds the, you've just thrown sand in the gears of understand of, of trying to get to scientific understanding because you're not coming at this in a sincere way yeah. it's, yeah. there's an agenda from the very beginning. That's not about science or about getting to the truth. It's about something very very different the, in the so, end the as, as soon as we find the real origin of this virus that will end all these theories that's what happened with hiv when they finally figured out ah it came from siv that was the end of the made in the lab same thing with ebola and every other virus so if we can yeah, do the work yeah. to figure out where this came from uh, that'll be the end of this yeah, still some echoes in sort of the conspiracy theory of course. corners, but of yeah, course. no, I agree with you. Um, and, and it's kind of funny, you know, when you step back and think about it, it's really, I mean, so, you know, I think we mentioned there's, you can buy a t-shirt that has the RNA sequence of SARS-CoV-2. It's th- about 30,000 plus or minus letters, wow, small right? small letters, huh? It, yeah, small letters, <laughs> but you know, 30,000 letters. I mean, we read books like, or, you know, yeah. uh, things off the internet that are much more than 30,000 characters in sort of the blink of an eye. And yet, um, I mean, that's, what's, that's really amazing is there's not a single scientist in the world that you could sit them down and say, okay, write out 30,000 letters for the next pandemic. That's just doesn't <laughs> no. exist. Like there's just, there's just no scientific understanding here. No. And so, yeah, anyway, um, some, <clears throat> some good points there. Okay, so our next letter is from Volker. Volker writes, Dear Nels, in Twivo 59, you argued that viruses tend to become less virulent over time. I think the Kelka virus used against rabbits is, a ver- is very weak evidence for this claim. A virus with 100% mortality will obviously burn out immediately. The Kelka virus started with some 99.9% um, mortality and is in is now um, down to 90% mortality, if I remember David Quammen's spillover correctly. Uh, Would you maybe consider the formula of Roy Anderson and Robert May that Quammen cites a formula, and then there's a formula here for um, considering the the sort of virulence here, and uh, address this on a future Twivo episode. Thanks and best regards, Volker. So um, first of all, the... Um, thank you for your letter, Volker. The um, virus I was talking about, Myxoma virus, is a pox virus, um, not a Kelka virus. But I think we're talking about the same thing here in that. Yeah. And it is true. This massively virulent um, mismatch in, um, in this case, the rabbit hosts, the um, European versus um, the American rabbits, if I'm remembering right. And that being a pretty um, dramatic uh, case. And so, you know, maybe one way of talking about this is in, you know, in, it is important to be careful about like that. I think that is um, the, maybe the key word here that wasn't doing enough work is tend to become less virulent over time. Um, and that's a pretty dramatic example, maybe a somewhat extreme example. And, you know, maybe one way of sort of um, coming to a, a bigger understanding here is to to really focus on what does it what what do we mean when we say over time, and what are sort of the evolutionary intervals that we're considering, and so um, you know, and could there be sort of blips along the way where in fact viruses could become more virulent um, in a population, especially if you're starting at a lower uh, mortality rate and then, you know, perhaps back off from that. And so depending on the snapshot or the window that you caught that virus population as it was moving through um, a host population, the your view on whether a, a virus becomes more or less virulent over time could is going to really depend on what kind of interval you're looking at and sort of the details of the viruses. So I think there is some reason to think that it's not like, given enough time that for viruses to persist in hosts that um, virulence may tend to go down. I don't know that I would put that up as like a, it's a like a, a a principle that has to be enforced. I think it might be a pattern with um, exceptions. Maybe is one way of 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 trying to explain it better. Um, 
it would be fun to have David Kwame. We had him. Yeah, we did. On, Remember? Uh, yeah. Yeah. F- yeah. Fun. His, his book, our recent book, we, he, we had a fun interview with him. We didn't do Spillover. No, we didn't. Um, we did but, uh, the, yeah. the Tangled Tree, I think, right? That's right. Carl, talking about Carl um, Woos and his um, sort of contributions to the understanding of the tree of life, the sort of the divisions of major branches. All right. So I pulled out <laughs> Spillover here and I looked up this formula. Yeah. So basically, the, it, it means the evolutionary success of a microbe is directly related to its rate of transmission through the host. That's R naught. And inversely, but related to its lethality, the rate of recovery from it and the normal death rate from all other causes. Okay, and then then Kwaman says in parens, the clunky imprecision of that sentence is why ecologists prefer math. (laughs) So the the, the formula is much more elegant than the sentences that describe it. So then he says, the first rule of a successful parasite is slightly more complicated than don't kill your host. It's more complicated even than don't burn your bridges after you've crossed them. It's the first rule of a successful parasite is this formula. That's what he's, that's what he's, he's summarizing Anderson and May, yeah. which yeah. in which they, they analyze the, um, this, this use of myxoma in Australia to rid uh, rabbits. <clears throat> so after time, it did go down to 70% mortality, but it didn't go away. And I think the trend is what's important that it starts out 99%, 9% lethal, and then after that first year, there's some rabbits that – those 0.1% rabbits have probably – have genetic uh, changes that make them resistant for sure. And that was figured out many years later actually. Uh, and then the virus changes somewhat. And if they don't – if the virus doesn't change, it's going to wipe out all the hosts, right? So it does yeah. – so this is an illustration of the decrease in virulence and the increased resistance of the host. I don't think it has to go to zero – you know, smallpox today in humans is still 30% lethal, right? Well, we don't have smallpox, but the last outbreaks were 30% lethality. So I think it's the trend that's important. It's never going to go to zero. And we have lots of human pathogens that are still pathogenic. Maybe they were more pathogenic when they started. But um, I think this is the only good experiment we have in mammalian viruses that address this because there isn't any el- anything else out there that's good. Yeah. No, and so to your point too on the rabbits. So it's sort of you know it's a two party proposition. Both of what the virus, mm-hmm. um, how that that population sure. is changing, um, but also how the what's happening with the host and who's left. Yeah, um, especially if it's a a super virulent scenario. And so there's a great paper just from last year, um, led by Francis Jiggins, um, pretty big group, um, including some good. Pox virologists and um, evolutionary biologists of so folks like Grant McFadden, Rasmus Nielsen. Um, and the, uh, the title is Parallel Adaptation of Rabbit Populations to Myxoma Virus. And so, in fact, because some of these rabbit carcasses were saved over yeah. the course of this um, <laughs> kind of natural experiment, yeah. kind of sloppy <laughs> natural experiment, um, they've gone back to the freezers yeah. and taken some of these um, you know, European rabbits that were introduced into Australia and um, actually um, uh, looked at the genetic basis of resistance mm. um, by collecting them um, from before and after the pandemic and then doing genome comparisons. And, and then, uh, so a really great story. Um, uh, not totally simple, um, but some uh, changes in immunity-related genes, sort of as you'd expect. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just sort of one um, you know, one adaptation on the host side, but sort of a polygenic basis of resistance that they propose. Um, and then they go on to actually do some um, tests in uh, looking at that variation in cells and how, what that means for the virus's ability to replicate. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, with, if that tends to happen too, just because your hosts, like the hosts that are around given an extended um, time window are the ones that are more resistant, then, you know, it's sort of virulence being modulated on both sides of the, of the interface. And so, yeah, it would be great to have more um, examples, more, um, you know, del- either kind of natural or, or deliberate experiments that get at this. But, um, 
some good reasons at least maybe to uh, propose that hypothesis. Um, but it's easy for me to just like, I can extend the time window as uh, if, if you come back and the, excuse me, the virus is more virulent. I could just say, well, come back in a thousand years or yeah, come yeah, back in 10,000 exactly. years yes. or something like that. And, I think and so. <laughs> we have an opportunity with SARS-CoV-2 to look over time. It's going to be many years to see what happens to its virulence. So it's a, uh, I mean, it's going to be tempered by population immunity, right? But um, there will always be new hosts. So we'll, we'll see if the in 50, 100 years, if it becomes any less lethal, right? We, we are looking at HIV-1 already since the 1980s. And I think there is some suggestion that it's its virulence is redu reducing or declining, but it's not huge yet. And it's not enough time. It's not that many years. If we think that the virus jumped into people in 1920, it's not much time in, in terms of uh, virus evolution, but we can do these experiments going forward. All right. Ken writes, <clears throat> while I agree that there doesn't seem to be good evidence that variants of SARS-CoV-2 are more transmissible, I'm uncomfortable with the claim that there's no selective pressure since it's already reproducing so well. Consider a variant that is doubling the number of hosts every week, competing with one that increases by 2.1 instead. <laughs> After 20 weeks, 2 to the 20th is 1,048,576, and 2.1 to the 20th, so those are the generations, right? 2.7 million hosts. So the 2.1 variant will have... Uh, over 72% of the hosts and the percentage will just keep increasing. So in other words, a small uh, difference in transmissibility might make a big difference. So I think that's a reasonable argument, right, right Nels? Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. And it actually, you know, it illustrates an important concept in evolution more generally is that the, like really small effects given enough time can really start to bend yeah, the yeah. needle or bend the curve. Um, there again, kind of an interesting, I think, cultural clash with um, – um, you know, being born and raised sort of scientifically in more in molecular biology or where, you know, we kind of almost seek out really big effects because they're easier phenotypes. Like we look for those clean phenotypes um, because we, we trust them. We don't, you know, if, if you're doing that sort of difference between two and 2.1, that's really subtle. And depending on my assay, mm. Um, I'll have to run that experiment. My sample size will have to be really massive and then I'll have to make a kind of tortured um, statistical argument. And so um, I think some interesting, yeah, just sort of scientific cultural stuff. But then that's right from an evolutionary standpoint. And in fact, I think there might be another letter or two that starts to get at this. But, you know, for example, that mutation, the D614G that has really been in the news and um, I think obviously got a little over the skis. I think as more data is coming in, that there, you know, there is some evidence that there could be something going on with transmissibility here that's sort of in that 2 to 2.1 sort of hypothetical, um, you know, ballpark mm. or something like that. Um, you know, still really, again, because it's such a, um, some minor effects and then depending on uh, getting at a really clean assay, right? What you would love to do is somehow have the ability to really um, nail down what the differences in transmission are in some controlled setting, which is uh, just impossible. Like it's just not practically possible. And yet sort of with a circumstantial case in, by independent groups, um, I think there was a paper even that just dropped in the last day or two um, from Vanit Minicheri's lab uh, looking at, uh, and then also from Ralph Barrick's lab doing some mouse experiments, right. um, uh, that there is a growing pool of evidence that there is something to this idea that it's not just sort of marble from a bag, the G, um, variant that has kind of uh, appears that it could actually have, um, you know, partially or almost, I don't, I haven't looked recently, but could be on the, um, could be a sweeping through the population. Right. Um, in this case, luckily, it's not, you know, some of the ripped from the headlines kind of things about <laughs> superbug, et cetera. This is not what anyone yeah. is seeing. Um, but there could be a slight advantage here um, along the lines that, that Ken is raising. Okay, so Scott writes, uh, Dear Tuivo people, Tuivo 58, discussing bat coronaviruses was great. Heather and Simon did an awesome job explaining their latest work. I was a graduate student in the Rollins... Uh, Smith Lab at Vanderbilt when Heather was an undergraduate in the lab. It was great to hear her scientific progress since graduating from Vanderbilt. Heather did an amazing job explaining her findings and putting it into the appropriate evolutionary and virology contexts. 
Uh, among the Microbe TV podcast, Tuivo has the least number of regular hosts. Tuivo would benefit from another voice on each episode. <laughs> I don't know if Heather would be able or willing, but if the latest episode is any judge, Heather would be a great addition to your team. Looking forward to future episodes, Scott. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for your um, uh, note there. And this actually isn't sort of like a surprise um, attack. Vincent and I have for a long time been talking about adding another voice um, to Tuivo. And so I don't know what you think. We haven't discussed this actually recently, but I would, I, I agree that Heather did an outstanding job. If she was interested, um, maybe it's like a pop quiz. If she's listening this deep into like Tuivo 61 yeah, episodes right. and here's us talking, reach out if you're interested in doing maybe a guest host stint. And it's actually the way I would maybe think about it, Vincent, it's almost like a two way interview where, you know, not, it's not like us figuring out who would be a great sort of third um, host, but it's whether anyone could tolerate the two of us um, <laughs> going back and forth and sort of sustaining, <laughs> yeah. hanging out with us. I, I would love to do those experiments. Um, and uh, I, uh, we, so that would be great. We have reached out, I think, to at least one other person in the past who was too busy um, to think about joining on a, on a more regular basis. But isn't that sort of what you've done over the years on some of the other podcasts, like maybe Twiv in particular, we've had people sort of sit in for a while yeah. and it's sort yeah, of yeah. people see come on and you see up. how they uh, fit in with the group because you need to have good chemistry. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much how I put together all the co-hosts or the hosts by by having people come on, yeah. Um now, Heather, of course, is a, is a postdoc, right? Um, no, she's a PhD student. PhD student, so and Simon Anthony's to, out there in your podcast, neighborhood, you know. And uh, yeah. but at every level, people have other priorities, and it's very rare to find people who, like Nels and others, are willing to commit to science communication. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, as Nell says, we've asked people and they say, no, it's too much work. And I've had that experience on all the podcasts. I understand uh, not everyone can do it. Yeah, but I don't want to pour cold water on it. So if that was something Heather or someone else out there, um, you know, wanted to reach out at whatever career stage. I mean, so there's obviously times where um, in my career where I can yeah. look back and say there were, where I made decisions at the time where it was like, well, probably that was probably not the time to commit this amount yeah. of sort of yeah. resources or efforts to something where it's been in hindsight, it's been like, oh my God, I'm so glad I did. <laughs> Hosting Tweet would, it would be one example of that. Um, so anyway, yeah, fun to think about. And actually that is for me, that would be a goal is that we would um, bring in another voice yeah. um, or, or some, some fresh energy to, um, expand our horizons. Yeah, and so, sure. um, yeah, that'll be a conversation we'll, we'll sort of continue into the future. Pete writes, man, men, people. What an amazing episode. It brought it all together in a way I hadn't considered before. I think this must be 60, right? I'm not sure. Yeah. Not that you all don't try to explicitly state the implications of a paper, but this was another level. I love the yep. contributors who acknowledged their appreciation of Twivo, but I am sure they all felt the same. P.S. I've been listening to Twiv since Vincent was on SGU. I think that's Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, but... Oh, interesting. Yep. I, don't, I didn't remember being on it. Thanks. All you people <laughs> oh, are amazing <laughs> and adding to the rationality of the world. Pete is in Sydney, Australia. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate <laughs> yeah, it. thanks, Pete. I thought that the opening reminded me wasn't like it was a month or something ago when Trump was trying to describe the IQ test. It was like man, woman, television. <laughs> um, you had to repeat it four times or whatever. <laughs> you see that now on some lawn signs um, yeah. that are um, sort of making fun of the IQ in that case anyway. Okay, so Ben writes, uh, hi, Tweevolutionaries. That's a pretty good one. I haven't seen that one before. Uh, congratulations on five fantastic years. Listening to the future of the field of evolution, something I thought that had never previously crossed my mind is the impact of evolution among somatic cells that is not heritable to the next generation. I suppose that this is best understood in the context of cancer where cells obtain a replicative advantage, but I was more curious about uh, otherwise healthy humans. If you take a sample of somatic cells, do you find an accumulation of deleterious de novo mutations in genes that would not have contributed to the fitness of that cell or its uh, parent cells since embryogenesis? 
On the contrary, do we observe de novo mutations in somatic cells that give them growth or survival advantages without contributing to the onset of cancers? Uh, might, these con uh, might these contribute to other diseases, particularly those of the elderly? I suppose the number of replications of an average somatic cell before apoptosis uh, before uh, cell death or apoptosis occurs would complicate this, but I can't see why these mutations couldn't occur in tissue stem cells too. Curious to hear what you have to say about this. Um, hear what's already known or learn why this might not occur. Keep on twi, uh, <laughs> twivo evolving, twivo, twivolving, twivo, yeah. Twivolving, um, yeah. Twivolving, yep. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. So this is a really interesting topic for sure, an active area of research. Mm. And so maybe two things kind of come to the top of my mind um, just for on somatic cells and uh, mutations. So one is um, this sort of, uh, I would say, somewhat controversial idea in um, brain development, human brain development. Um, this is work by Fred Gage. Um, I think John Moran's been involved in this, so some folks who think about retrotransposons. Um, but the idea that in um, developing neurons, that there actually there's some level of line one activity that's sort of a flavor of retrotransposons that has a, it diversifies the genome um, by copying and pasting. Um, it's a not completely, but somewhat random process. Um, these uh, line ones might land in the promoter region or even interrupt a gene in rare cases or an intron, change the regulation. Of, of some of the um, ge genetic, um, you know, architecture, gene encoding territories in the genome, and what's been proposed is that this, some, these somatic changes that don't, won't go on to the next generation are actually have been proposed to be involved in sort of productive brain development. Hmm. Um, pretty controversial, and the reason being that the, it's you know one of the <laughs> sort of main points here, which is this, how do you encode that sort of randomness yeah. to happen by generation to generation? So it's sort of this, um, you know, without going to the next generation, you're sort of, um, how do you kind of get a foothold, evolutionary foothold on this sort of stochastic process that's going to somehow lead consistently to something beneficial? And so there's several papers that uh, try to lay out at least some evidence consistent with this or make the case, but still far from, I would say, an open shut case. In fact, a pretty controversial idea that I think um, kind of catches um, some evolutionary biologists sort of as like fingernails on the chalkboard mm -hmm. even. I'm thinking about how you might do that. Um, so, okay, so that's example one, but I think worth reading about, thinking about, and considering some of the possibilities there. Um, the other example that I'm thinking about that gets to um, sort of uh, stem cell scenarios, so um, in some local work here, actually, um, doing some, in genome science, doing some really deep sequencing on um, some stem cell samples from people uh, uh, where the... Um, Samples have been collected, blood samples, sort of hemopoietic cells, um, over uh, different ages, mm -hmm. actually. And then trying to do, given that we can sequence uh, so deep now and sort of accurately, trying to make estimates of on de novo uh, mutation rates um, and what that might mean for um, exactly some of these, like kind of, you know, phenotypes yeah. potentially in elderly uh, as as we all get more old, um, really challenging here because you know there's always and this is another maybe big point with evolution is to always be thinking about what are the things that I can't see in a population and so if there's as we each of us age if there are certain cells that might gain mutations that and then the cells can't persist they undergo apoptosis or something like that then they're lost from the population they're sort of invisible to the biology that's going on and so there's an ascertainment bias in what we're actually um, sampling with the cells that do persist. Same time, I think there's still some early data that there are some patterns like this, more somatic things. But in any of these cases, I think it's worth just kind of thinking about, you know, that you know, like the cancer case, for example, to me, the most sort of compelling dr bridge drawn from evolution to cancer are in those contagious cancers that actually move mm. um, <laughs> yeah. through generations yeah. that move from host to host. Right. Those are the easiest in a sense, to um, sort of apply evolutionary principles to some, of course, some in somatic cases, um, an important and ongoing topic that's gaining momentum. But, uh, you know, again, maybe a slight proceed with caution in some of those cases. Yeah, right. Good point. All right. Anthony writes, uh, concerning the CRISPR technology Nobel Prize, he presents a quote from a 1955 book called The Phenomenon of Man. 
with the discovery of genes, it appears that we shall soon be able to control the mechanism of organic heredity. The dream upon which human research obscurely feeds is fundamentally that of mastering beyond all atomic or molecular affinities, the ultimate energy of which all other energies are merely servants. And thus, by grasping the very mainspring of evolution, seizing the tiller of the world. <laughs> oh, boy. <Oof. laughs> I think that that's pretty dramatic. Uh, giving us too much credit. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we we, no, pretty, we certainly seized uh, the evolution of many uh, living things in the world by, by what we're doing to the planet without even having the ability to ma manipulate genomes, right? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And some of those um, atomic maybe echoes, right, with both atomic energy but also atomic weapons yep. and what that has done. Um, no, so <laughs> a provocative – if this is the, Anthony, who we've heard from many times, another great provocative – um, uh, source here, um, you know, and, and so tying this to CRISPR in particular, of course, this notion that we're going to start to sort of like with scalpels change yeah. genomes and, you know, so what are in the two main categories? So, and actually maybe following on from our last letter, um, the ethical considerations of doing that in somatic settings. So a case where you alter a genome, but not in a way that it's going to be not in the germline so that it won't go on to the next generation. And in fact, this is already happening or is, you know, kind of in early trials for things like, um, you know, treating HIV, actually, you're trying to cure mm -hmm. HIV, um, where you do your own stem or, um, you know, bone marrow transplant, you, you're, your don your self donor, you pull out some of your bone marrow. Yeah. Um, and then have that, uh, use CRISPR technology to put in like a CCR5 deletion mutation where now the HIV can't recognize the main receptor, yeah. um, or alter, you know, add a restriction factor or something, add, uh, alter the cells and then give them back and, and hope that then the infection will sort of just wipe itself out. So that's, you know, I think that's happening and there's good reason to do that because you're not, it, it really doesn't go to the germline. And so you're not sort of altering future generations. The, not the ethics on the germline stuff, that's a whole nother animal, I would say, sure. much more slippery. Sure, yeah. and, and kind of fits into, I think, the bigger conversation that um, not just CRISPR, you know, CRISPR didn't invent this conversation. Um, we can go back to more, instead of scalpels, um, sledgehammers, ideas about eugenics and what you would change or selective breeding, you know, as it applies not just to like animals, but also our own species yeah, right. um, as well. And so, um, yeah, it's in, it really is interesting though. How so? I I do uh, in the past. I've done a couple of a series of lectures to an undergrad class. It's actually a freshwater ecology class, but mm -hmm. talking about CRISPR and and to try to use that as an entree into some of these bigger sort of ethical ideas. And yeah, it's yeah, yep. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Anthony. Um, next letter from Yuri, uh, d dear doctors uh, Eldi and Racchianello, um, Racchianello. Uh, don't do any racking yelling at me for mispronouncing your last name. There, Vincent. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've been an avid listener of Twivo for about a year now. You're doing a great job. I currently work in vertebrate genome evolution myself. Uh, I'm new to the field, and I find your podcast both enlightening and entertaining. I'd like to suggest two potential guests for your future programs, perhaps when you once again have time to talk about things <laughs> other than viruses. Um, the first is Dr. Eric Jarvis, a professor at Rockefeller University. Uh, and the second is Dr. Scott Edwards, professor at Harvard. Um, sincerely, Yuri. So first of all, Yuri, thank you. Um, and yes, I agree. And in fact, um, I can't remember if I invited both, but I certainly remember inviting um, Scott to Scott Edwards uh, to um, join our last episode to contribute mm -hmm. a clip, um, a five-minute clip. Um, hang tight here for a minute or two when we move into our picks of the week, because I'll mention Scott Edwards again, a really cool thing that he did recently. Um, but yes, so you're right, Yuri, we've gone <laughs> well out of balance in the last year. Um, our, our attention, like all of our attention has been drawn to SARS-2 as we step through some of the evolutionary considerations of the, um, the SARS-2 pandemic that's ongoing. Um, but, you know, and, and I think the, the more of that to come, of course, as we're all um, navigating with this, but um, absolutely, there's a lot more evolutionary biology going on and we're almost, I feel like it's almost stacking up. Um, we could be start doing episodes uh, every week, every, you know, twice a week as TWIV. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the, there's so much great 
stuff out there, including by these two incredible investigators, really science heroes, Good. Um, thinking about evolution in birds um, in particular. Yeah. Um, and fitting uh, perfect fits for the um, the the kind of um, work that we often try to highlight here on the podcast. So stay tuned. And as um, new work emerges both from um, the Jarvis Lab and the Edwards Lab, um, I would you it, it, it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. It will, in time, I'm sure we'll have one or both if they if they're interested in in joining us on the podcast. All right, so I think that wraps the mailbag. It does. That was good. Caught up, yeah. Ooh, feels good. Always feels like a relief to kind of move through those. So onto the science picks. I'll go first, if that's okay. Yeah, it's sure. like it's kind of listed it, um, which is uh, <laughs> following on that last suggestion from Yuri. Um, Scott Edwards just finished a bike trip, a hmm. uh, bicycle trip across the country. Um, this was inspired uh, east coast to west coast, inspired partially by. Um, uh, this little uh, an initiative called Black Birders Week, and this is sort of following on from a lot of the energy we've seen around the Black Lives Matter movement um, in the last several months. So for my pick, I'm including a link to a really great article with Scott Edwards uh, from Audubon Magazine. Mm, cool. Talking about his journey, and in fact, I was following this a little bit as it was unfolding. He was tweeting about it. I had a sort of social media present, including some of his colleagues. Um, Sarah Otto, in particular, was helping to um, to put this together. Um, there's also actually a GoFundMe account that I want to link to this because I think it's still active. I just checked it right before we started recording um, to support diversity initiatives and in evolution. Um, and so, you know, the goal is I think 50,000, it's above that now, but wouldn't it be great if we kind of kept contributing? I put in a small contribution a few months back as Scott was actually making his way across um, the country. And I think it's really putting mm. a finger on something that really needs some attention. So, you know, if we put uh, as, you know, if we look at science in general and issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, some real headwinds, some real progress that could be made. And then I think if you look at evolution in particular, um, the numbers get even worse, that there's um, a lot of middle-aged or older white guys with beards, myself included. And so um, that, like anything that we can do along these lines and sort of these inspirational, really creative things like Scott hopping on his bike going across the country and sort of having that dialogue and sharing that experience of crossing the country, I think is just so inspiring and um really starting to move us uh, into in a better direction uh, with a lot of work to do going mm, ahead. Neat stuff. Yeah, cool. I can't imagine riding a bike across the <laughs> U.S. Uh, in pandemic times as well, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. And so, um, you know, some really, in some cases, kind of harrowing stories about figuring out, okay, where am I going to camp or yeah, like find yeah. um, places to stay and um and some also some cases of like like in going through Iowa and I think there's some flooding in some of the rivers yeah. and how do wait what does this do to what, the detours that sort of show up as well, I guess um, you can read for more details in the Audubon article but he made it you know and this is like nearly four thousand miles with only three flat tires which is pretty remarkable given all of that distance covered. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? I have a, I have a website called the 30 computers sculpture project by Forrest McClure. He's a sculptor. And, um, I found this many years ago. It's quite an old uh, website, but the website basically documents his project to take 30 discarded personal computers, take them apart and then make sculptures from the parts. And, uh, you know, he started this in 2001 and, I don't know if he's still doing it because the website is quite old, but he has photographs of many of his creations um, and they're viruses of all sorts. So oh, there's wow. a beautiful, yeah. um, my favorite is this bacteriophage called computer virus number six, uh, which oh, yeah. is, he calls a T9 track tape virus. And oh, wow. you know, the, it's made of all kinds of components and, I once saw an exhibit of his uh, in Virginia when I was in Washington for a meeting and I saw his adenovirus, which is bigger than me. You know, it's a huge thing and wow. it's got all CDs glued to it. And <laughs> and I've actually, he's actually written in uh, years ago to TWIV uh, asking questions and so forth. So it's really cool, huh. really good stuff. Yeah, I, this is I, great. I'm I like this idea of repurposing things and making art out of them and making viruses is even better. So 
Check that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking through some of the galleries it's here, cool. or cool. as he calls them, headshots. Yeah. Yeah. And the computer virus one through seven. Yeah, isn't it I cool? can see the one that you're highlighting. Oh, that's really something. Number seven is beautiful. I love that one. I've used that as uh, art on huh. many TWIV episodes. Yeah. So I don't oh, know wow. where yeah, Forrest is and uh, what he's doing, uh, but this is a, this is a really cool project that he did, worth taking a look at. I agree. That's really neat. All right, that's Tuivo sixty one. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Tuivo. If you like what we do, uh, you could contribute. This month in November, you can go over to parasiteswithoutborders.com. You give a one shot deal and they'll double, they'll match it, which is really cool. Otherwise, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for other ways that you can help us out as well. And all of you who are helping us, we appreciate your support. And of course, questions and comments, Tuivo at microbe.tv. TV. You can find Nell Zeldi. Well, he's at the University of Utah. If you're ever out there, check it out. But uh, easier is to go to cellvolution.org or on Twitter. He is L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Great to kick off the sixth season together. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Tuivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You can find them at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Till then, stay curious. Stay curious.